Hello everyone from the Teammates Forum and beyond. I'm Anne and I've provided this month's MIDI mock-up challenge. If you're watching this and you're not on the Teammates Forum, you can head over to Facebook and join us. The forum is run by Kenny Wood, who wrote a fantastic book about composer assistants and who created this group for those who aspire to be composer assistants, who are currently assisting, and those who have been there and can share their experiences. In this video, I'll walk you through how I did my string mockup of Jurassic Park. I chose this piece because I initially thought it was easy to program, but due to the excessive amount of tenudos, it's actually pretty difficult. There are probably people out there who could do a more realistic mockup of this, but I've tried to do this how you realistically would at a professional studio. Because in the real world, a certain quality standard is required, but we also don't have time to massage one minute of music for days on end because we have an hour or two of music to write and program within, you know, a month. I've done this in uh, about three hours, including note input. So what you're about to see is a fairly realistic depiction of what a professional composer would expect of you when they ask you to do a mock-up. All right, I'm not gonna bore you too much with my general setup because that's not really what this video is about. Generally, I just have two computers. One is the host computer that is running um, the picture, that is running the DAW. And then I have a PC that is connected via a network connection. And that PC is essentially just there for sample streaming. It runs Vienna Ensemble Pro and all it does is load all the samples that I need for my template and just stream them through the network as I need them in my composition. My favorite library is Cinematic Strings 2 and Cinematic Studio Strings. They're made by the same people essentially. One is older, the other is newer. But Cinematic Studio series, I think, is probably one of the best sample companies out there right now. And then I layered some CineString Solo into it. But that's essentially all I'm using right now. I used to use other libraries as well, but I found that these three libraries really work the best for me personally. I just tried out a lot because I've worked in sampling before and um, these were just the ones that really go well with my programming style and my idea of what strings should sound like. So the first thing you want to do when you layer different libraries, even if they're from the same sampling company, is you want to go through them when you set up your template and you actually want to put a negative track delay on all the patches, on all the tracks, the MIDI tracks, because there will always be some kind of delay before the sample actually triggers. And those values are also often different for longs and shorts, which is why I like to separate those out instead of using expression maps or you know having everything in one track. I'm very much a split patch person. Generally, you want to time them correctly because when you're mixing different libraries, especially by different companies, they will be made by different people with different standards, with different numbers. You know, it doesn't mean one is better than the other. It just means they were using different conventions for editing. And so you want to streamline them. Otherwise, you just get really, really messy results because then one library kicks in after 60 milliseconds and the other kicks in after 20 milliseconds. Another might have a delay of 100 milliseconds on it. And then, you know, it just sounds like a really messy school orchestra, essentially. So that's really something you want to avoid. The first thing I did was I actually took the audio file of the actual piece and loaded it into the DAW because in the sheet music, it says tempo 60 but it's actually not tempo 60. I loaded it into the DAW and clicked my way through it. And weirdly enough, it's a really consistent tempo. I mean, I'm assuming John Williams conducted this and he consistently stayed with very slight deviations just in tempo 50. 
So it's actually 10 BPM slower than what it indicates on the sheet music, which I found very interesting. But it also, it sounds as if there are much bigger tempo variations in the piece, and there really aren't. So the flow is really just within the microtiming that the studio musicians did, which they do very well. Even when they're recording to click, they do that very well. It, it doesn't sound like it was recorded to click. But this one was clearly conducted, but in a very consistent tempo, which really only speaks to the skill of John Williams because conducting consistently in tempo 50 is actually really hard. Anything under tempo 60 is really hard to maintain because it's slower than a second and you tend to rush a little bit, which he didn't do. So kudos to him <laughs> for conducting marvelously as usual. I tried to program everything in legato patches, which obviously is not gonna work for the final result, but I wanted to see how far can I get just with legatos and by putting in, you know, the legatos where they belong, not putting legatos where they don't belong. I really stuck to the sheet music here. In Cinematic Studio series and also Cinematic Strings too, the nice thing is if you don't overlap the notes, it's not actually going to trigger legato. And also if you want a fast legato, you just use a higher velocity and then it's going to trigger fast legatos instead of portamentos, which you rarely want ever anyway. This is what it sounds like just with legato patches in the different libraries. I'm just gonna play through them to show you how it sounds and you'll quickly see where the problems are. Okay, so now you see in some parts it actually works where it is flowing and more legato, but it just doesn't work in the spots where we need that attack. A nice thing that um, Cinematic Studio Series has also is if you're not using legato, but you up the velocity, it will increase the attack. It just doesn't quite work the way I want it to work because it's usually a bit harsh and also the more you increase the velocity, the more pulled back the attack gets. So it sounds a bit early. So it's it's kind of a programming issue with the library. I mean, I appreciate they've done that. It's a really nice idea, but it doesn't quite work the way I want it to work. So essentially, I went into my shorts patches. I turned the mod wheel all the way up because in these libraries, I programmed them to all react, the, the note length reacts to mod wheel. So all the way up is long marcados. And then um, what we essentially end up with is we have the entire thing played again by marcados in all the libraries that I've just used. And we layer that in softly into what we did with the legatos, just to give it that tenuto feel as opposed to a legato feel.
So by themselves, obviously, the marcados sound really weird. It's really odd. And also the solos sound a little bit out of tune and it's just not how you want it to be. But that's okay because we're just using it as an effect. You're not actively hearing it in the final result. So in terms of CCs, I mostly for this one used CC1. I usually support it by also using CC11. Didn't do it this time because uh, it just was really unnecessary. I don't know why. And then another thing, you will see I didn't add a lot of processing. I have parallel compression going on to give it that Hollywood sound. I'm not going to get into that right now. I mean, there are plenty of videos online that you can watch if you're really interested in that. So the only other thing I added is two reverbs. You usually add two because one is for just creating a little bit of depth and creating a room, and the other one is for an actual reverb tail or color. So I use a preset I created myself from the Lexicon Hall. I love that reverb. It's, it's a very inoffensive reverb, um, and it comes with a lot of really good presets. I usually modify them a little bit, but, um, you know, in general, it's a really nice, warm, well-rounded reverb that works really well in a variety of instances. And then I use Valhalla Room for some coloring. Valhalla is not really a natural sounding reverb usually. Even when I modify it, it always has this slight modulation sound to it. But that's actually really cool if you want to add some color. I like using the Bricasti preset, naturally. Uh, I modified that a little bit, but yeah, that's, that's all I'm using, and I'm not using a ton of it. Then the other thing I have going on in my routing is um, I have EQs. I have some preset EQs on it. That doesn't mean you can't ever move them. Of course you can, and I do sometimes, depending on the piece. But there's some basic EQing already happening that I just know works well with my writing style, that I know works well with uh, the libraries that I'm using. And it's essentially years of just tweaking it a little bit and realizing I was doing the same thing over and over again. So at some point I was like, why don't I just set that up in my template and just leave it there? And then if I need to change it, I can always change it. And then the only other thing I have going on really is uh, Ozone. I love Ozone. It's probably my favorite plugin of all time. It's just the best. It has everything in it. You don't really need anything else. It just does a marvelous job of making everything sound glued together. You can also use a tape saturator for that, but Ozone just does a lot more. It also has an AI function now where it can, you know, analyze a different piece that you like and that you want your piece to sound like and then it'll suggest to you how you can master your piece to sound like that and to have the same loudness and everything. So again, I've created my own preset from just listening through the presets that come with the thing and then just picking what I like and essentially creating my own thing. That's always a good way to go. If you don't know a plugin yet, just go through the presets, see what those presets do and see what you like and then just create your own out of that. It's a really good basic way to go. And then the more you know the plugin, the more you will modify it. Like I always modify my ozone settings for every single cue that I do. It's always slightly different. I know some people had trouble with the violas because violas in general don't project as well and they do have the melody in this string arrangement. Personally, I would probably not give the melody to the violas by themselves if I'm writing. Um, but neither did John Williams, by the way. This is doubled on other instruments because the, the reason why it wasn't quite balanced the way we had it was because we didn't do the whole orchestra. Because obviously there's also choir and brass and percussion and woodwinds going on. So there's stuff missing that would have supported the violas in this instance. Some people used actual Divisi patches for the Divisi in, in that is in the sheet music. I didn't. I generally don't use Divisi. I mean, few libraries even have Divisi. 
it's because it never sounds good. It's always out of tune, it never sounds like an actual section playing DVC because they're recorded separately. You have more room build up and just, it just doesn't sound, it's kind of like portamentos, which also never really sound good. It's in the nature of sampling, certain things just don't work. Now some people are really concerned because if they use two full patches, all of a sudden you end up with, you know, a hundred strings. Doesn't really matter though. It doesn't make that much of a difference, to be honest. Like I've, I've never had that issue and I don't know anyone else who's had that issue. It's a theoretical concern that if you layer too many libraries, you end up having too much. But as long as everything's timed right and volume balanced, it doesn't really matter. The same way that people are sometimes concerned about libraries being recorded in different rooms, Yes, some of them blend better out of the box, but you're putting a proper reverb or two on it anyway to blend it together, and then you're using tape saturators or plugins like that that will glue it together again. So I've never particularly had that issue, to be honest, uh, where that would be a major concern. The only concern could be one library is way too loud compared to another library, so then you just need to balance it out volume-wise which you can, you can already do in your template by simply uh, adjusting the volume from the get-go. If you know this library is much louder than that library, or even just this patch is much louder than that patch, then you know set up your template to compensate for that already from the get-go. So you never even have to deal with that again. I don't, I just copy paste pretty much from one library to the other because everything is set up exactly the same way, and so I don't really need to modify a lot. Now there's some other stuff going on in my template, which I'm not going to get into right now, because we'd be sitting here tomorrow still if I were to explain my template. But the programming is really the number one thing that you want to be focused on first before, you know, applying anything else. Just see how your libraries sound first. Because I see a lot of people applying a ton of plugins, a ton of stuff that you really, really don't need. It's just really not necessary because a lot of the modern libraries are recorded by you know, some of the best engineers and some of the best recording spaces with the best players, um, they don't need that much TLC anymore. I would really try and work with the patches as they come out of the box first and then see, you know, where are the shortcomings and how can I solve that with EQing or other stuff. I generally turn off the contact reverb because I just have better reverbs. I mean, even even if you just use the internal reverb from Logic or uh, Cubase, or you have something cheap like Valhalla, um, those are better reverbs usually than what comes with contact. So I would always turn that off first, apply your own reverb, and be sure to apply it via sends, not on every track. That's not how you do it. You're gonna just blow through your processing power and you want the same reverb on everything. And then you regulate the amount via sends instead of changing the reverb for every single track. That would be way too much work. Generally, there are quite a few videos on uh, string EQing. It also kind of depends what libraries you use, of course. It also depends on uh, whether there's something else going on. In this case, we only have strings but the moment you add brass and woodwinds, you would EQ the strings slightly differently. It's, it's kind of depending on the situation and on the piece. But for my overall EQing, what I usually have in there is I open it up at around 12K, some people do 15K. Essentially what you want is that air at the top. It's high frequencies that we can't actively hear that well. It's just to brighten up the sound up there a little bit and open up the frequency spectrum because especially for contact, it compresses the sound quite a bit. So you want that reopened up. But also what happens is sample libraries are denoised, which essentially means in order to um, avoid room buildup, 
since you don't have one ensemble playing in a room, you have essentially five or six ensembles playing in a room layered on top, you also layer the room noise on top of each other. And that stacked room noise can give you a hiss that is not very nice. So sample libraries run through usually uh, Isotope RX or some plugin like that to kind of reduce that extra noise. Now, the issue with that is you also kind of lose a little bit of the nice air and a little bit of the um, harmonics and, you know, the nice sizzle. So you want to open that back up. But what you also get with sampled strings is you still get those layers of room on top of each other. And usually when something sounds too bright, it's not up there. I've seen some of you guys just dipping everything down, like actually making a shelf and dipping down all the high frequencies. That's not where the brightness is coming from. The brightness is coming from frequencies between 2K and 4K because that's where our speech frequencies are, and that's where our ears are hearing the best. Let's just put it that way. The physics are a bit different, but let's just say the frequency response of our ears is the best in a 2 to 5K range, because that's where our speech is. Naturally, if a mix sounds too bright, it's usually in that range where the frequencies are building up. And that's incidentally also where the room often builds up and where you get hisses and sizzles that you don't want in there and that you would normally not get if you weren't using samples. So what you have to do is find, you just create a peak in your EQ and you find those frequencies that are bothering you and then you drag it back down and just take them out by however you see however much you see fit. I usually do somewhere between 2 and 4 dB just to reduce that frequency that is bugging me and making it sound bright. So I would not necessarily kill the frequencies above 12k because that's usually where the air and the breath sits and the, the bow noise and, you know, a lot of noises that actually give the samples their realism uh, as opposed to any annoying frequencies that you don't want. Then another frequency range you always want to watch out for is the 300 hertz to 500 hertz because that's where the mud is. You don't want to dip it out too much because that's also where a lot of warmth can sit. The warmth is usually more around 200 hertz. But yeah, if you have a pretty full arrangement, you can get a bit of a muddy buildup around there. And dipping that out will actually clean up the frequency uh, range of your mix. So that way you can actually get a lot of clarity. So you see, I'm not really doing a lot. I'm just kind of tweaking it a little bit. I will also say I very often, since I have a background in sampling, I will go into the patches and program them the way I like them, you know, kind of modify the envelope of the samples, modify volumes, whatever the patch allows me to do. So the more you know contact and how to modify patches, the better off you are. You're out of luck if you're using East West because then you're dealing with play. But as soon as you, as soon as you do uh, contact and you click on the wrench, if you have the full version, you can modify a lot of things. So if I don't like something about a patch, I can just go in and go, you know what? I don't like how long these samples are ringing out. I'm just going to change that. Or I don't like that this articulation is so much louder than that articulation. And I can just go into the groups and, and modify that and save it. So I would definitely recommend get as much contact knowledge about the back end as you can, because even if you get a library that doesn't entirely work for you, you can make it work for you and you can reprogram it. I mean, the only thing you really can't touch is um, the script, because usually the script is locked, because that's intellectual property of whatever company made that library and you can't access it. I really think the takeaway here is know your libraries, know how they react. Even if they're from the same manufacturer, doesn't mean that they work exactly the same way. 
So really know your stuff, know your libraries. The better you know them and the more you can modify them, the more you know contact, the more you can do with them and the more realistic they're gonna sound. Because it's not really about having this or that library. You know, I know people who can't work with the stuff that I work with, know how to mix it, know how to modify it, know how to program it, know how it reacts at every velocity, know the negative delays, know how to EQ it, and then you will generally get really good results unless the library is really old and really bad. And generally, don't use stuff if you don't know what it's doing. Uh, I see this a lot. I've seen this in my additional writers. I've seen this uh, in the mockups that were done on the teammates forum. If you don't know what this plugin is doing, don't just use it because someone says it's good. Because if you don't know how to use it, it doesn't matter how good it is. If you use it wrong, it's going to mess up more than it's going to do any good. Really just take baby steps. Like I have probably a total of four or five different plugins in my template. So I'm not even using that much. I know there are composers that use way more than I do, but they also know what that stuff is doing. Every time you add something to your template, be sure that you've really done your research on that plugin and you really know what it's doing and you really have tried it out enough and you feel confident in using it without um, turning knobs blindly and just going, well, I wonder what that's going to do. And then very often it does nothing or it just makes it worse. All right, so if you have any specific questions about this mock-up, feel free to use the comment section. Or if you're on the teammates forum, of course, um, you know, comment on wherever this is posted and I'll try to answer your questions. Or if it's if multiple people have the same question, I might just do another video on how to do that. But yeah, that's it for now. I hope this was helpful. Uh, this is kind of my first tutorial video that I ever made, so don't judge if <laughs> if this is a bit wonky. Uh, I'm, I'm learning. This might actually be the start of my YouTube channel, who knows? Definitely wanna make more of those, but um, We'll see. It's, it's a bit of a time commitment, so I'm gonna see what I can do.